So welcome back to part two of So Do You Want To Be a DOP? Um, if you've not watched it yet, part one is in the description. Well worth the watch, there's some tips in there even for professionals. It's mainly focused on people either coming from ground zero or they've kind of got a little bit lost on the career path and they're looking to reset. Yeah, here we are, um, part two. And as promised, we're going to start off with, should you work for free? If it's a commercial project, um, a drama or whatever, it's highly unlikely you'd ever be asked to work for free. Um, I, I can't remember a situation where that's happened because there's already money behind that. Um, so if, if something like that did happen, um, I think you'd certainly raise an eyebrow uh, and probably you'd be, do best to just walk away. There'll be certain things that you come across, passion projects, so pop promos, short films, and uh, that will require your time for free or nearly free. Um, if it's something that you believe in, absolutely do it. Um, pick your project wisely. Um, you know, get to know the director, um, what they want to achieve, uh, and then you could have, you can have forged a great relationship with someone, which hopefully can go forward. Uh, and you can have great stuff for your reel too. Yeah, never work for free on a commercial project, but I've done loads of stuff for free. In fact, it's probably Paul who's taught me into doing the most stuff for free. Surely it should be the other way around. As a DP, you generally relinquish the content at the end of the shoot, and you put it into the hands of the director, the editor, the colorists, and you hope that they do it justice yeah, you can't polish your turd, but at the same time, you can absolutely ruin a masterpiece. So, should you offer your time for free to sit in the grade to make sure that you get some influence over the quality of the final product? You need to have respect in yourself, uh, the quality of your work, and that your time has a financial value to it. Um, if I had a great relationship with a client and they asked me to come and maybe oversee a, um, a colouring session for free, to be honest, I can't even imagine a situation that would happen because they know that I'd say no. Is right. I've never asked him to sit in on a grade, paid or unpaid, actually. Paul has once or twice done his own grade at home. I mean, mainly I think it's just because, you know, like, like me, I think he just likes playing with with footage and um, and he's probably just had a day off the day after the shoot so you know he's sitting and, and done his own grade and then sent either sent me over a lot or some reference um, stills from it and that could be really useful if you are working with a first-time director or if you want to have some kind of impact in the grade there's a good chance that um, that is going to find its way to the colorist and it might stop a masterpiece being trashed. So let's say you've done a great job. Uh, how do you turn that first time client into a long term client? How do you get that next gig? Once you've got a foot in the door, then creating repeat business should be fairly easy because you'll be able to show straight off the bat how good you are at your job, which they knew anyway, which is why they hired you. Um, you can also build on the relationships. Uh, you can ask them what they've got coming up, you know, like slightly cheeky, uh, ask them if they need any help on, on anything else. Uh, and your, your name will naturally come to the front of their mind if you're the right person for the job um, when the next thing comes through the door. So yeah, certainly getting the, your first job will really help you know, get your foot in the door. Um, but again, don't pester, because like nobody likes that. Um, and if they call, great. If they don't, they don't. So I half agree with Paul here, and he did say it's a little bit cheeky, but it can be a little bit awkward. And obviously not with people that you know and you know, you've know you worked with many times, friends, etc. when they ask you, oh, what have you got coming up? But when it's the first time you're working with them and you can tell that that question is canvassing for future work. My next job, I may be on an NDA for it. I may still be fighting for the work myself. Um, 
the maybe I've got somebody else attached. There's a lot of reasons why that can be a little bit of an awkward question. And I, this is perhaps the best bit of advice you're gonna get. The only thing I need to know from that point is, did you enjoy working with me? Do you like the way that we run this ship? Do you like the team that we've pulled together? That's what I need to know. Because I've already made my mind up if I want to work with you again. So all you need to do is really simple. At the end of the job, thank them for the opportunity and say that you'd like to do it again sometime. Stroke their ego a little bit. If there's an area you can touch on, if you can say, I really like this crew, I really like the catering you put on, I really like that t the time that you give me to make the image look beautiful, I really like your style, whatever it is. Um, it doesn't have to come with a compliment like that. It could literally just be, I've really enjoyed the shoot and if you want to do it again, yeah, give me a call. It's as simple as that. But all that stands for nothing if you don't do a great job in the first place. So Paul, give us some tips on how to just guarantee you do a good job. On any job, as a DP, it's your job to have thought about every problem or every issue you may come, up, come across on set. Uh, and you need to have a solution for it because there's no you can't wait around for something to be fixed or mended or moved. You need to have already figured out what you're going to do in that situation. Um, for instance, if you're shooting outside and it's a cloudy day, that's pretty easy. But what happens if the sun comes out? How are you going to match those two parts of the scene when you've got you know, one side of the conversation it's in cloud and the other side of the conversation it's in burning sun? So you need to plan for those eventualities. Uh, you need to already have your uh, 20 by 12 silks made up and they need to be ready to be slid in so you can continue shooting. You can't all of a sudden stop work while it takes the sparks, you know, 20 minutes to erect a 20 by 12 and put a silk on it while everybody's standing around scratching their asses. That's on you. You need to make sure that you're ready for that before it even happens. Even if it sits there all day and you never use it, it doesn't matter. You're ready for it if it does. Yeah. Waiting is expensive. And um, just to add on to what Paul said, it's important for a DP to know not what can be fixed in post, but what can be finished in post. Half an hour saved on set is, is either hundreds to hundreds of thousands of pounds saved from the production budget, or it affords your director an extra half an hour to do what he or she wants to do. Either of those scenarios is very positive for you. Efficiency is key. Yes, beauty takes time, but there's many ways to be efficient with that time. But what if there's certain things that you feel you need in order to be efficient and the producer doesn't agree? It's really important to talk to your producer and let them know of any problems that potentially could happen down the road. So you've seen straight away what some issues are. Um, when you're writing your kit list, your lighting list, uh, you know, you'll have the solutions for the problems within those. Um, when I submit a kit or lighting list, I will have already had the conversation with the producer. I say, listen, this is on there because we, are, we might have this eventuality. I'll tell them what the kit's there for uh, and what I will use it for um, to keep the production running. Um, then it's kind of on them whether they say yes or no. And on the day, uh, if you have a problem and there's a bit of kit that they've turned down for various expense reasons, well then that's just how it is. Um, it, it's not on you. Um, so maybe there's a little bit of covering their back, but you know, a, a good producer will trust you and make it happen. Uh, they'll listen to you. They'll realize that what you're saying is right uh, and, uh, and they'll hire that bit of kit that you need or that bit of lighting equipment that you need. So uh, that's uh, probably a dig at me. Many years ago, me and Paul and obviously a large crew did a commercial. It was ambitious for the budget, but that was nothing new really. Uh, it just meant some, you know, being creative with solutions. For one of the scenes, I needed a big wide shot and that required some thirsty HMIs, which means that I needed a generator. Usually for lighting, I go to a very reputable company, especially for a commercial shoot. Um, you need that reliability. 
and on this one I went to a smaller, less reputable company. Um, I also knew the owner, so he struck me a really good deal, which was great. The cost savings afforded me solutions to other parts of the budget that needed a little bit of extra help. Yes, I passed it by the agency and the client um, because it was a risk. All these sort of things probably should go in how to be a producer video or a director video. Maybe that's a, some future videos. Let me know in the comments if you want those videos. And um, Paul and Mark, the gaffer, advised against it. Which is nothing new. Uh, me and Paul have had many debates over the years over many different decisions. Majority of the time we agree on things, sometimes we disagree, but I generally always make the right decision. Um, whether it is to agree or disagree, whatever, I'll find the solution. This was not one of those occasions. We got all set up for this big shot and the journey went down. Bearing in mind, I'm producing and directing. I've got 40 plus cast and crew, a client and an agency to manage. The a potentially shoot stopping incident happening. At the same time, I'm having to direct in my cool, calm manner. Oh, and to add, injury to the situation uh, this particular commercial needed a hell of a lot of choreography and my choreographer fell ill the night before i wasn't aware of it until after breakfast when she approached me and i could just i could see i knew she had to go on there was no way she could make it through the day another person's role i've just now adopted it was an interesting morning we got it all sorted you know we flipped the shoot about around a little bit and it was an hour and a half before we got another Jenny on, so before we could shoot the big white shot, obviously we just flipped the scene backwards, which was a hell of a lot for me to kind of process in where everybody needs to be, how everybody needs to hit the marks. There was a lot of people in the scene, so a lot of supporting artists, and it was a potential disaster, despite the fact that the new Jenny took an hour and a half to arrive and get fired up. Thanks to the amazing crew that I had, we only ended up half an hour behind the original schedule, which we pulled back in the afternoon and it actually turned out to be a really good day shoot in terms of what we got in the can. The moral of the story is, Paul and Mark, the gaffer, they got to play hero with the rest of the crew and just muck in and get the behind the solutions and save the day. I only had myself to blame. It was my decision. If things do go wrong, that doesn't mean that you should just go, oh, I told you so, and that's an opportunity for us to sit back and wait for somebody to fix the problem. Um, no, it's an opportunity for you to then be a hero, and that is going to put you in a far better position when it comes to you know, getting thought about for those next jobs and the next jobs and the next jobs. It's all about just ending the job on a good note and then affording yourself to be able to say, I've really enjoyed myself. If there's an opportunity, give me a ring. Speaking of opportunities, what should you be charging? Because when you get that phone call, producers are not stupid. They know that the first person who mentions the price is the person who's at the biggest disadvantage in the negotiation. Um, so if they don't turn around to you and just go, oh, by the way, APA rates, don't worry about everything, everything's by the book, then there might be some kind of negotiation going on. So they're always going to ask you, what's your rate? Um, they're always going to try and get out of you what you want to charge for the job first. So what should you be charging? Paul, enlighten us, will you? After sort of initial conversations about the job with the producer and availability, then it, it always, the conversation always turns to money. Uh, get everything nailed down then. They may come to you with a number. Um, if you're happy with that, fine. Um, it really does depend which area of the business you're working in. If it's commercials, then it needs to be APA, which is uh, just Google it, look it up. Um, what, by that point, hopefully you'll understand the job. Um, you'll understand what kind of time that it's going to take. I mean, it's pretty much universally accepted on overtime. Um, you know, after a certain amount of hours, you can charge overtime. Um, there's points where producers might try and do deals to include that or not include that. It's best to get all that stuff agreed in advance. Recce's are work days, um, so you should absolutely charge for them. Meetings, I don't charge for, um, and I don't think there's any producers that would ever expect to be charged for a meeting, unless it was something very specific um, and it was discussed beforehand. Uh, it's the sort of thing you wouldn't charge for. When a producer starts asking for deals, then there's maybe there's something you can do for them uh, in terms of that kit hire. If you're coming along with equipment, you can definitely find some margin in, the, in that to help them. 
um, it, you know, you don't have to, but if it's somebody that you have a long-standing relationship with, then it, you know, it's, it's a really good thing to do. Paul's given a pretty conclusive answer there. And for production, besides somebody getting hurt, there's no bigger failure than going over budget. Um, yes, there are thousands of examples of productions going over budget and then going to, into the ratings and the box office and people end up getting rich and it's a big success. Uh, but I can guarantee you on every single one of those productions, during the production period, people were getting fired, people were shitting themselves about getting fired, or at least shitting themselves that they're not gonna get hired again. My point being, if a producer's looking to make a deal, it's less likely that it's just out of greed, it's more likely that they are just wanting to cover their ass. And if you hold them over a barrel, or you feel like you're in a position where you can negotiate hard, um, just be aware that you could be putting them in a more vulnerable mindset going into a shoot. Um, so if you're going to negotiate hard, you best make sure you do a fucking good job. Uh, and if you do do a fucking good job, the next time when they come back to you for the next job, you're not going to need to negotiate nearly as hard because they, they know your worth. Saying that, you've always got to remember that a good producer is a good negotiator. They know all the tricks. They know that the first person to name the price is automatically on the back foot. The person coming from the biggest position of need is on the back foot. Just knowing those two things, that's automatically going to put you in a better position for the negotiation. You have to let them know that you want to do the job. There's a willing there, but they need to at least think that you don't need the job. And that's going to put you in a far better position going forward just those two things obviously there's a thousand if you want a video on negotiation down below but again that's probably more of a production video a good negotiator a good producer you're not going to feel like you're in a negotiation when you're in the negotiation you're just going to feel like a, a friendly chat and you want to keep it that way you know leave the arguing to agents who the bad ones are going to take the 10 15 20 percent that extra that they piss your client off to get you anyway. While we're talking about rates and what you should be charging and etc. There's another thing that people generally don't talk about is actually getting paid and getting paid on time. Getting paid um, can be a, a touchy or a difficult subject to broach. Um, if it's a new client, um, I generally ask for 50% up front. Uh, and it's best to have all these conversations as soon as possible after you've had the job. Just so everybody is on, you know, singing from the same hymn sheet, everybody knows where they stand. Industry terms for getting paid is 30 days. You should always have that at the bottom of your invoice. Um, that gives them a, a time frame for when you should be paid within. Know who you're sending the invoice to. It usually goes to accounts rather than to the producer or production manager who hired you. Uh, knowing that person is also really useful because if they do go over the 30 days, you can give them a little nudge and say, hey, uh, where's my money? Uh, and just be cool, you know, be cool about it. You, there's no need for shouting, you know, down the phone conversations at that point. Um, you know, and uh, with any luck, you'll get paid pretty quickly. So there you go. We've pretty much covered everything but the art of becoming a DP. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope it's been relevant. I've been James Statham. He was Paul Mortlock. A big thanks, buddy. And we will see you next Tuesday. Don't forget to hit that like, subscribe, and yeah, I'm out of here. Do all the good stuff. See you in a bit. Ciao. Bye.